Life is about taking risks. We're all chasing self-worth in some way or form. For some, the risks required to reach the ever-escaping feeling are significantly more than others. But there is a beauty in that. It is what makes us all different from one another. Try hanging onto an axe that is stuck into a frozen waterfall hundreds of feet in the air. Yeah, that sounds terrifying to me. But others think ice climbing is relaxing. While a sport overlaps the more popular mountaineering, ice climbing can be a little more extreme at times, but it does not have to be. It can also be peaceful and calming to some. But sometimes, tragedy is a part of this chase. This is the story of the vertical ice climber, Guy Lasselle. If you haven't watched one of my videos before, first off, thank you for being here. But you are going to want to stick till the end, as there are some amazing words spoken by those closest to Guy. Ice climbing is a majestic dance with Mother Nature. Most of the time, you are scaling frozen waterfalls, the side of a glacier, or maybe climbing through the boulders mixed within ice that make it difficult to find any grip. It is more extreme than normal climbing, as while ropes and harnesses are used in both, ice climbers can be seen wearing crampons that hold their feet in place, and of course their most valuable tool, their ice axes. Many climbing routes are difficult to get to as it may take scaling several ice walls to reach the desired, more difficult climb. Naturally, most of these walls take some form of mountaineering as the most sought after climbs typically lay on some of the most famous mountains in the world. There is a similar difficulty scale as traditional rock climbing. I promise I won't bore you too much, but these are called grades and range from WI1 to WI7, with 7 being the hardest climb. These are usually reserved for long, extremely technical, and bad ice routes, while 1 means that no tools are required to climb. Essentially, most people could climb climb up a WI-1 and only a select few in the world can even attempt a WI-7. Any other climb would fit somewhere on this grading scale. There are a number of other factors that can determine the difficulty of a climb, but to keep things simple, I'll refer back to this scale. If you think that sounds interesting or maybe fun, don't forget the risk of avalanches, falling ice, or simply poor stability on the wall, all increasing the risk that a traditional climber would face. Personally, I don't know why anyone would want to try this sport, but there is a great community that love ice climbing. And like all sports, there are pioneers that all others are chasing. For ice climbing, this is Guy Lasselle. Guy started his career ice climbing while in college at the University of Ottawa and would attempt the 100 meter Le Congeli, a WI3 climb which requires some equipment, but is relatively secure and has some areas to even rest. It took Guy over seven hours on his first ever climb, and years later, he would solo the same climb in less than five minutes. Guy began traveling to the Canadian Rockies in 1983 and could never get enough of climbing, but there was one thing that set Guy apart from everyone else. He loved to free solo. Free soloing is when someone climbs a route solo and with little to no protective gear. One mistake leads to paying the ultimate price. You may have heard of Alex Honnold, who was made famous by his documentary Free Solo in 2018. What Alex is to traditional rock climbers, Guy is to ice climbers. Someone who can compartmentalize their fear in their brain and push through boundaries that nobody else on the planet would be able to do. It is fascinating to me to learn and watch individuals that can do this and would recommend anyone who is interested to watch the documentary. What stood out most about Guy was not only the accomplishments or first solos of the many walls that he is known for, but his humility and love for his sport. He originally got his degree in physical education, and when he wasn't climbing, he would spend his time coaching and teaching the next generation about mountaineering, the outdoors, and of course, ice climbing. He also loved to write articles detailing his climbs and best tactics in the famous Gripped magazine. All these alone made him locally known, but his name and persona exploded with his triple solo on the trophy wall located on Mount Rundle in Canada. He would climb all three walls known individually for their difficulty in one climb. The Sea of Vapors, Exterminator, and The Replicant. All three 160 meter WI-5 and above routes. While scaling these walls, the ice is not great, there is no place to rest, and you are essentially vertical the entire time. 
When ice climbing, some walls are split into multiple routes or segments because of the difficulty, time, and physical strength that is required for each. Many routes are an accomplishment by themselves, but becoming the first person to solo all three, now that put Guy where nobody else could touch him. It was also common to find Guy at the many ice climbing competitions in the early 2000s, and he would become the ice champion in Colorado in 2000, 2001, as well as another competition in Quebec in 2004. This led to international recognition, and even more so when he won the Bill March Summit of Excellence Award in 1999. I could make a whole video about his accomplishments alone, and it would still do Guy a disservice to all that he meant to the sport. In December of 2009, Guy traveled to the Bozeman Ice Fest in Montana, one of the premier ice climbing festivals around the world. Guy had missed the competition the prior year in 2008 due to an injury, but was healthy and ready to take on the walls in 2009. To Guy, ice festivals were some of his favorite moments as he was able to enjoy the sport he loved with friends and other passionate climbers. It was early morning when Guy and his partner would set out on the gully wall. In a competition, there are multiple groups of climbers on the wall at any one point in time, so it was no surprise to Guy to see groups already above him. They began their climb. An ice axe, swinging into the frozen waterfall, stabilizing his body. Then multiple kicks of his crampons into the ice as he planted his feet into the wall, searching for any stability. The same moves he did every year, and quicker than anyone else around. The same moves that he trusted with his life many times. Although he was climbing with a rope and partner, it only slightly changed Guy's usual approach. Since he wasn't free soloing, it would only slow him down slightly, but not by much. They were making their way up the frozen waterfall that was sectioned into two pitches on the side of a mountain. They were challenging for most, but more fun to a climber like Guy. As the day progressed, so did Guy and his partner. It had been over an hour since they had started the two-pitch climb known as Silken Falls and were close to eclipsing the ice. They made quick work of the last few feet. They stood on top of the cliff looking down at what they had just accomplished, then quickly gathered their gear and began hiking up to a gully to their next wall of the mountain. It was common, especially in a festival, to complete one wall then hike to another further up the mountain, so the pair was not surprised with the other groups of climbers still ahead of them. It was at this moment, while the pair were hiking, that one of the groups above them gripped their ice axes and struck the slope of the mountain. This area was roughly 8,900 feet, not a vertical slope, but a steep incline of the mountain that was covered with a dense snow. Their crampons would shortly follow their axes into the few feet of powder, but something was off. They were struggling to find a secure patch. Near the crown of the ridge, they would continue digging into the slope to find any form of stability. The climbers did not know it at the time, but because of the ridge and gully below, they were in the middle of a wind-loaded snow pile which was extremely dense and stood on facets. Essentially, this means if the facets were to break away, it would bring the feet of snow with them down the gully. It was at this moment, while digging their axes into the snow, they felt the break and could do nothing as they watched pieces of ice and snow start to fall down the steep slope, picking up speed quickly and accumulating more snow. It was a domino effect. Guy and his partner stood in the gully when they heard and felt an ice climber's worst nightmare, an avalanche heading straight for them. Not much is known in those last few seconds before the avalanche would hit Guy and his partner, but the gully had several different cliffs and rocks around them, so it could have been very confusing as to where the avalanche was coming from, as line of sight was not clear until the snow was almost upon you. Knowing the climber that Guy was, I can't help but think he fought until the snow took him. The avalanche would hit Guy, and he could do very little as it carried him across the gully and down the ice waterfall. His partner stood off to the side of the avalanche and watched in horror as his friend and mentor was swept off his feet. Guy would be carried to the cliff that he had just finished climbing and down the two pitches of frozen ice before he would come to a stop. The 54-year-old had no chance, and the ice climbing community would lose a legend of the sport. I wanted to do something different for this video, so instead of me telling you about what Guy meant to everyone in the ice climbing community as a whole, I thought I would share some words from the many climbers and loved ones that knew him best. His tribute video will be linked below as they could describe who Guy was better than I ever could. There was nothing very superfluous about Guy. He just had these really succinct things in his life. and. Yeah. Guy loved to chronicle things, and he has a record of every single climb he's ever done, 
If he did it a hundred times, it was going to be chronicled a hundred times. Guy made these epic lists of his climbs and things he wanted to do, 10 best routes, 100 best routes, and those lists inspire us still. He did more new ice routes than anybody ever will. Uh, just an amazing accomplishment. I don't think anybody else really climbed solo without much consistency on ice. He was really one of the preeminent ice soloists of all time. There are climbers that I've never met that I would have loved to have met. When I go ice climbing, I think of Guy, and it affects how I climb. Guy's climbing is legendary. I doubt anybody on Earth has soloed as much ice as Guy. And when I think about Guy, I actually don't think of his climbing first. I just think of him as a, as a human. He, he was really ethical, and he worked hard, and, and uh, was a good person to be around. He was a happy man, and he tried to spread his happiness wherever he went. Some people said he wasn't original. Others said he was crazy. Anyway, people thought he died poor because he had no money, but he felt he was the richest man on earth because he had many friends all over the world.